Today I want to cover the biblical use of the term gate as it appears in, throughout the Bible in both the Old and the New Testaments in both Hebrew and Greek. And the term gate appears dozens of times in many situations. I want to uh, give the, show us the pattern of how that works out. Now the very first time that, uh, that in the New King James that I found the use of the term gate in the Bible is Genesis 19.1. And it says when the, now in Genesis 19.1, Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Well, the, what does it mean, sitting in the gate? So if we take a look, and there are many phrases about sitting in the gate or in the gate. So we want to take a look at, at that meaning. And if we take a look at the Hebrew word, uh, and Strong's, it's H8179, it means an opening, like a door or a gate. It could be to the city, it could be a door to a building, a, a gate to a bigger area, or maybe even a port. So this particular Strong's word, basically it's an opening, uh, and we'll get a more understanding of it as we go along. Now, I grew up on a farm. We had cattle, and we had fences, plank fences. I helped build some of them. We used railroad ties for some of the fence posts because we needed solid fences. But the corral, you have to get something in and out of it. So therefore, it was important to have a gate. The same thing is with uh, uh, barbed wire fences. We put in, uh, now cedar posts, of course, are, will last a very long time. My great-grandfather used oak posts. And that was about uh, uh, 1885, right in there. Those oak posts are still there on the farm in the ground. Uh, so certain kinds of wood will make that fence strong for a long period of time. So I grew up with those. Nowadays, we use steel posts. Steel post hammer, bang them in the ground. I use uh, uh, panels, uh, fence panels, put them on the steel post to keep my sheep in. Works pretty well. Uh, then there's electric fences. And if you're not raised on a farm, do not run up and grab a hold of the electric fence. I'm just going to tell you now uh, because you'll understand why the cows stay on one side of the electric fence. But of course, they've got to be able to get in and out of that pasture. Uh, I do remember my one of my daughters was age six. And she didn't know about electric fences and I failed as a parent to fully explain to her. And so she reached out to steady herself and she was wearing sneakers at the time. And then I saw her, oh no, but I was too far away to stop her. And then she sat on the ground very calmly and quietly started taking off her shoe. And I said, well, why are you taking off her shoe? She says, I think my foot is bleeding. And the electricity had gone through and zapped her on there. But she understood the value of a fence from that point forward. And now she's 35 and we don't have to worry about her worrying about the electric fences. Now, sometimes cattle get out of the fences. And we had a dog look very much like this. And it's only when you want to go somewhere, it seems like somehow the cows got out, the uh, fence was broken or the electricity was off. Whatever it was, you got to round up the cattle. And then what do you do? You got to bring them back into the corral or into a safe place. Uh, and of course, there's got to be a gate that gets into that corral. So the gate is meant to hold things in or as in the case of the Great Wall of China, the Great Wall was meant to hold uh, uh, the invaders out. So sometimes it's to keep things in, sometimes it's to keep things out, and then the portal is a gate that goes between them. Now, I built wooden gates. I've installed these like tubular steel gates uh, on the farm. Indeed, uh, uh, I have these kind uh, on my place now. And <clears throat> Uh, and you see some are more decorative gates. Uh, the one on the one side, I actually have those exact gates installed to uh, 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 for entrance into the sheep pasture and such. So the gates are a portal. They're a pathway. They're meant to restrict incoming and outgoing. Now, I took this picture, so I know it's not a copyright problem, uh, uh, in Eastern Europe, in Estonia, at the... Uh, just about a, uh, three blocks or four, about four, a quarter of a mile away from, from the uh, hotel. And you'll notice there's a long bridge or a causeway, that, a narrow entrance, 
And then there is a gated place in the wall, a big steel barrier gate that comes down. So, if, and they call this the bishop's castle. And if you looked at it from the sky, uh, it's really uh, 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 it's really on a man-made island uh, where they built up an island and to prevent uh, attacks. It was built uh, uh, about a thousand years ago. And so it was a medieval fortress from the raiders. And we all know that the Vikings raided that area commonly so much they even call it a Scandinavian country now. Uh, the, but in order to protect them from the outside uh, attackers, they put a moat around this particular castle. In fact, many castles have a moat uh, if they're not up on a mountainside. And then there's this causeway, and then there's this narrow gate for an entrance. And once you get in the gate, you can't go straight into the uh, facility. They Almost every gate, and I've seen these in several castles in Europe, I've seen them in multiple castles in Japan, and they've designed them so that when you go in that gate, if you had a horse pulling a wagon, you, uh, you couldn't go straight in. You would have to make a turn, and then people on top would be able to uh, use their weapons of war to defend the castle. So the gate was the first, uh, or the causeway, and then the gate was meant as a barrier to pe keep people from coming in. And the, but even then, the design was to slow down any attacker invader. Um, in this particular case. So now let's take a look at, we went back to Genesis 19, 1 again, and, so and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. Well, Sodom was a city where he had moved to from his separation from Abraham. And Lot was sitting in the gate. Well, we took a look at Strong's, means the door opening to this city. So the city had some protection, uh, a wall around it. This was in, so I see, were we just referring to the the gate to the city, the door of protection. We're going to learn a little bit more about that. But the gate is a point of entrance or point of exit. Let's take a look, and we're going to get into that in a minute. Let's take a look at Genesis 22, starting in verse 15. And this is referring to what we would call the Abrahamic blessing, well, what the Bible calls that. And verse 15, And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself I've sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this. And this was the, in, the occasion upon Isaac being, uh, uh, being willing to offer his only son Isaac uh, and would not withhold him from God. Verse 17, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the, which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of your enemies. So here this term appears again. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. Well, descendants possessing the gate. Well, the gate is the entryway to the enemies. But as we'll see, there is more to it than that. Um, the gate is really a place of control, whether it's controlling entrance or controlling an exit. We progress on through the Bible to Deuteronomy 5, in verse 14, in its recitation of the Ten Commandments. And Deuteronomy 5, 14, But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, uh, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, or any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. So, who is within your gates means who is under your control, under your responsibility, under your authority. That's what you're responsible for. So the term here, uh, gates, is, indicates not just an entrance or an exit, but somebody controls the entrance or the exit. Um, another, uh, just uh, if we read on in the next chapter in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9, and, it's, and it talks about the commandments of God and what we should do about them. And in these words, verse 6, chapter Deuteronomy 6 and verse 6, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign in your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes 
And then it says, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So we're looking at this both literally and figuratively. It ought to be when somebody comes in, they understand your value system, your gates in your area of your control, the doorpost or the entryway uh, of the gates to your place. And the Ten Commandments ought to be obvious that you're not obviously, um, uh, th that that is the standard which you expect. Um, if we take a look uh, in the book of Ruth, and many of us know the story about Ruth and Boaz, and how Ruth, the, the whoever married Ruth, would be entitled to what was her father-in-law's property uh, as inheritance because her child would inherit that. So it was a value to marry Ruth. And Boaz had somebody else that could have, that had a closer legal responsibility to marry Ruth. Uh, but that person bargained it away and gave it to Boaz and said, no, you go ahead and marry Ruth. And so Ruth chapter 4 and verse 9, And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, and then Elimelech's sons, Chilion and Malon, from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren, and from his position at the gate. In other words, fulfilling his the, his responsibility, you are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. Now, this is a confirmation that legal decisions with witnesses were done in that decision-making place, at the gate or in the gate. So it was a place of responsibility because then they did not have, as we do today, notary publics, where you sign with witnesses on and they put the official seal or stamp on it to certify the name. Here they went to the gate and the elders and other decision makers and witnesses there were able to confirm legal decisions that would be binding. Somebody couldn't come back on it. There was just too many witnesses. Now we take a look <clears throat> um, how people use the gate in an inappropriate manner. Now King David, of course, as the ruler of Israel, was responsible for making the decisions. He was the ultimate judge, as you would, uh, 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 as as a king would be, in the kingdom. But his son, who had his eyes on the throne, found a way that he could perhaps uh, usurp the authority to himself. In Second Samuel fifteen and verse two, now Absalom, that would be King David's son, would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. So people who were going to have a legal decision made, a judgment made, or they had a dispute of some sort, we read on, so it was, whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision, that Absalom would call out to him and say, what city are you from? In other words, he would befriend them and would say, your servant is from thus and such a tribe of Israel. In other words, he would engage them on the way, well, you know, like, what is it that you... You know, what is your issue? I can settle this quickly. You don't have to wait for the king. Remember, he was rising early and people that had were aggrieved and wanted a decision would naturally want a quick decision. And so Absalom did this and we read on it that to win the hearts of the people, but he did so by standing on the way to the gate. So he would say, well, well let's just resolve this uh, rather quickly. So Absalom use that understanding of the decisions in the gate to undermine King David, uh, although we know it didn't work out too well for him. In the book of Esther, we have uh, King Ahasuerus was looking for a bride. And this is uh, uh, the Persian king had taken over uh, 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 the kingdom of Judah, brought them, as, uh, brought them uh, uh, under Persian control and hauled them far, far away. And Hadassah, which is the Hebrew name uh, uh, of Esther, which is the Greek name, um, she was one of those selected to be a potential queen of the king. And so 
when they say virgin or young women, they're talking about unmarried women uh, or girls. And so I put several different versions down, <laughs> translations. But her cousin, who actually acted as her uncle, uh, as a legal responsibility for her, was Mordecai. And Mordecai, as we read in the New King James, sat within the king's gate. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, complete Jewish Bible, he would sit at the king's gate. A common English version, Mordecai had become a palace official. Uh, more clarity. And so <clears throat> Mordecai had a position of responsibility. Even in a foreign country, uh, he was uh, a, a government official in the administration of the Persian king. So we, uh, we read on and we read in the uh, Beyond Today Bible commentary that, uh, uh, that Mordecai, of course, could see what was going on because he had one foot in the uh, uh, Jewish community, but he also knew what was going on within the palace of the king. We look at the expositor's uh, concordance uh, uh, notes on verses 19 through 20. The expositor's concordance says, Mordecai's position at the gate was not that of an idler. In other words, just hanging around like you see some people standing outside of a 7-Eleven store. No, it was but represented some kind of duty or official position he occupied. He may have been appointed to this position uh, by Esther to give him easier access to the royal quarters. Men who sat at the gate were frequently elders and leading respected citizens who settled disputes that were brought to them. So this was done historically, as we know, all the way back from uh, Abraham and Lot uh, and on down through time. And here we have this practice continued on, uh, settling disputes or issues that came before the ruler. <clears throat> if we read... In the book of Job, in Job 29, and verse 7, and Job writes, When I went out to the gate by the city, I took my seat in the open square. Well, when the gate opens up, and then there's the open square. And if you visited uh, uh, one of those, uh, as we had mentioned earlier, a castle ground, she, the gate opens up to the inner square. And so he had some kind of, of a position. And if we read on in Job, we'll see he was also a decision maker when it references his place uh, at the gate. The book of Proverbs gives us additional uh, bits of wisdom as to where the decisions are made. In Proverbs 22, verse 22, do not rob the poor because he's poor, in other words, he can't defend himself, nor press the afflicted at the gate. The gate is where those kinds of judicial decisions were made. And just because a person isn't in a good position to defend himself, you don't uh, uh, you don't take advantage of it. Proverbs 24, 7. Proverbs 24, 7. Uh, this has become one of my new favorite ones. Wisdom is too lofty for a fool. He does not open his mouth in the gate. Basically, uh, if you find yourself in a hole, quit digging, is a, is a Texan way to put it. But in other words, don't open your mouth when it's going to get you into trouble uh, uh, to have some... Uh, in other words, to be wise. Uh, and so you can read this both ways. But basically, in the gate is a place where uh, judicial decisions or official decisions can be made. Amos, the prophet, speaks of the future, and he's talking about the future time in Amos 5.10. And, and you think about this in today's mindset, today's world. Amos 5.10, they hate the one who rebukes in the gate. They abhor the one who speaks uprightly. Ever hear of somebody complaining about their speeding ticket? Oh, the dirty, rotten judge, so-and-so, whatever, uh, threw the book at him? Well, nobody wants to be corrected. That's very uncomfortable. And they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the... And we see a lot of that in modern society as well, where they mock the truth, they will mock the Bible, they will mock uh, people who want to uphold the truth. Uh, and they don't want to follow any limits that were set by God for their own benefit. So they will abhor the one who speaks uprightly. 
Uh, a couple of verses later in Amos 5.12, I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. Isn't that what we see in many places around the world, including this country, is that there's one set of laws that for the people who are the in crowd, and then there's a different kind of justice for everybody else. So it's who you know uh, as far as whether justice is administered or not. And Amos is saying, uh, don't do that. <laughs> it's a problem because you are diverting the poor from justice at the gate. The people who cannot afford to defend themselves uh, 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 can get mightily hurt. A few more verses down in Amos 5.15. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. And we have other examples where there's the unjust judge that Christ spoke about. Uh, but there wasn't justice in the gate or in the decision-making capacity of the community at that time. And Amos says, you really need to hate evil and, uh, evil and love is good. The decision makers should. They should understand that difference uh, between evil and good. Now, if we take a look in the New Testament and we look at the word gate is a Greek word uh, uh, in Strong's G4439. And remarkably, it means gate. It could be literal, it could be figurative. It's a, a, an entrance. It says the leaf or wing or a gate of a, of a, a, folding, ent a folding entrance. So pretty much the same as we had in the Hebrew word. It uh, uses the manner, it says the gate, and it generally refers to a larger sort, a gate in the wall of a city or to a palace, to a town, a gate to the temple. Interestingly, or to a gate to a prison. In some cases, to keep people out. In that case, it would be to keep people in. The uh, Interesting, there's a, a verse, and we aren't going to cover a lot of it today, or that, the gates of hell which is looking like into a vast prison, according to uh, Strong's. Basically, it can be used in the physical or the metaphorical sense. The access or entrance, it says, into any state, condition, or being, uh, or place. So if we take a look what Christ said in Matthew 7, verse 13, what did he say about gate? And of course, we know that gate uh, is restrictive. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. So you have the narrow gate and the wide gate. And if the wide gate is there, it can accommodate a lot. Uh, but in verse 14, but because the narrow is, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, there are few who find it. Gate is small. It's not a big, wide gate that leads people to destruction, but a narrow gate that leads to life. <clears throat> Matthew 7, verse 21. In Matthew, uh, Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, and this is Jesus speaking, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Well, what stopped them from eternal life is because narrow is the way. Narrow is that gate, that entrance uh, into the kingdom of heaven. And so they may mouth all the right words, as it were, and play act like they're a Christian. But what does Christ say? I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, not following the laws of God. Uh, in Luke 13, uh, verses 23 and 24, we have something similar uh, that Luke records in Luke 13, verses 23 and 24. And then one said to him, to Jesus, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Kind of makes me think of some of these big events like a concert or a stadium where 
thousands and thousands of people want to get in, but there's an entrance. And if you've got a ticket, you stand a chance to get in. If you don't have a ticket, they're not going to let you in the gate uh, into that particular venue. <clears throat> but there is a ticket. And the ticket is in Revelation 22 and verse 14. In Revelation 22 and verse 14, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So the, the tree of life is pictured as being on the other side of the gate in the kingdom of, of heaven, in the kingdom of God. And to get there, you've got to enter the gates into the city. And so that tells us some of the use of the term gates. Now, I'm going to refer to, and I don't have it up on the screen, but Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, where God instructs Moses before entering the promised land. In Deuteronomy 13, verse 19. And he says to Moses, I call heaven and earth as witness, witnesses against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. In other words, you're going to just, you're ready to enter into this promised land. Now, we did tell Moses that he personally would not go in uh, to the promised land, but the uh, people of Israel would be able to. And Joshua, shortly after that, in Joshua 24, verse 15, said it this way, when he laid it out, before the house of Israel. Joshua 24, verse 15. Choose whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So he was very interested in progressing on through what we would call the narrow gate, the narrow way, and avoiding the broad way to destruction. So when we go through, and there are many dozens of places in the Bible that use the term uh, in the gate, uh, by the gate, uh, and so forth. It'll give us a little better understanding of that term each time we come to it. It just generally means to exclude those who don't need to be there uh, and uh, or that shouldn't be there and to restrict it to those uh, who are willing to follow the laws of God.